we're ahead of schedule. Nice going. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a problem that I see in the political consulting community over the last couple of uh, years. Because everybody likes to talk about what we do wrong. People like to say our polling is wrong. Our modeling is wrong. Our f approach to field campaigns is wrong. Well, now I'm going to tell you one more thing that I think is wrong about political campaigns. And that is our community's approach to creating. Um, oh, where's the little toggle thing? Oh, here it is. Um, and so let's talk about how we do creative right now in the old way. We spend big money on expensive video shoots. Thir so in the US, it's like $30,000. Latin America as well. They spend huge money on video shoots to produce a few TV ads. You take then those few TV ads, and then you air them on really expensive broadcast television. Um, in, the, in other countries around the world, you literally take a couple of sign concepts. I've got an idea. Let's put the image of the candidate on the sign with their name and the logo of the party, and let's produce millions of them. This happens in campaigns all around the world all of the time. We're producing a few sign concepts and printing hundreds of thousands of them and putting them out there for public consumption and thinking that we're, we're persuading people. And also in literature, we're producing a few literature concepts. We're spending all this money producing, printing hundreds of thousands of literature concepts. At the end of the day, we only have a few creatives. Now, this is a problem in the modern era. Why is this a problem in uh, the year 2018? Because our targeting capabilities are infinite. You know, we, you can go into Google, you can go into Facebook, any number of uh, uh, DSPs out there, and you can literally target down to the most micro block level out there. Yet the problem that I always see is that the campaigns only have this much creative and we have that much targeting ability. So, and this is because we're still producing the creative in the old way by spending a lot of money to produce very few concepts. Um, so that's the big issue. The creative is not assets are not keeping up with the targeting. In addition to that, pro the, the problem of the targeting, we also live in a multi-device, content-rich environment where content becomes stale quickly. And we can see this, and you can see this by looking at your your digital results. When you put up a piece of content, literally within 48 hours to 72 hours, your content starts to become stale. The number of shares goes down, the engagement rate on your content, the content goes down, and it becomes stale. Then the social media platforms stop optimizing for your content, and you need to put out something, something new. So when you have a multi-device, content-rich environment where people are constantly being exposed to advertising and brands on this phone, on tablets, on laptops, on large screens, you need to be producing far more content as opposed to spending a lot of money to produce little content. Guess who, and of course, no presentation by an American is not complete without a mention of Donald Trump. Guess who produced a lot of content and sustained an authentic conversation over time? That guy, who did it the old way, We all, you know, by producing fewer pieces of content, uh, we all know who. So if you don't believe me, there are some statistics to back up what I'm saying. First off, the average number of brand exposures per day for a person in the Western world uh, in a city is approximately 5,000. This is up from in the 1970s of 500 uh, brand exposures a day. Um, the average number of ads only exposures a day, not just like seeing a logo or something like that, 362. The average number of ads you note, note that means that you even acknowledge there are an ad, is 153. So right there you can see over 200 uh, some advertising you're being exposed to a day, but you're not actually noting that they even exist. So you know, why produce fewer content if the chances that your ad is going to be completely missed by the public? Um, the average number of ads only that create any sort of awareness, about 86. The average number of ads only that make an actual impression where you want to engage with the content, 12. So the, we're being bombarded by messages. So we need to be creating a lot more creative to ensure that our creative breaks through and that we can properly utilize the targeting tools that we now have uh, with, with digital and other and direct mail and even you know, addressable TV in the US and things. So basically, I think I've been pounding this over and over again, but I believe in message repetition because I'm a political consultant. If you're producing just a few creative concepts, you're uh, you know, taking a massive, massive risk. So what's the solution? You know your message from your polling and focus groups, you, but you don't know necessarily what's engaging. The people know what's engaging. So you can use real-time uh, engagement stats to help you decide which ads to scale. 
So one of the things that we often do is produce a, you know, several creatives along a uh, side of message. And then we look at see what's, what's engaging, and then we choose to place more money behind the engaging ad and then scale back what's, what's not engaging. Maximize your reach and frequency across your target audience with the engaging advertising. And it's now cheaper to produce and distribute cartoon, uh, image, and video content than ever before. Graphic designers are a dime a dozen out there. But also, video production need not be what it was in the 1990s. You need not have a crew, you don't necessarily need a crew of 10 people. Uh, you don't you <coughs> need necessarily need you know, all of these, the, these bells and whistles. Even nowadays, the most you know, uh, 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 small operations, you know, they, like video guys and things, they'll have like their drones so you can get aerial shots. Um, and you'll also have like a camera that's literally as big as like this that can do you know, movie quality uh, video production. There's no reason why we need to be spending all of this money on shoots as opposed to be, uh, and, and to produce a few pieces of creative as opposed to be producing a lot more creative. Um, and so practically, how do we implement this at Buzzmaker? One of the things that we do is what I call the daily face tweet and viral image ideas. We're literally constantly giving ideas to the client who then approves them for final uh, message that we then produce and that, that we then get final approval and that we then put out there and that we then test and then we optimize. So um, the other important statistic in addition to engagement that a lot of political consultants overlook is the Facebook relevance. Now, Facebook uh, judges every ad from a one to 10 uh, metric as to how relevant that is to their audience. Because Facebook, at the end of the day, wants to keep, and Instagram as well, want to keep people on that platform. Um, the more that they do that, the more money that they make. So if you've got an ad that's not relevant to people, that's not engaging with people, you're going to be spending a lot more money to put that ad in front of people than if you have an actual engaging ad. Um, so like this is a, an incredibly important, especially when you're talking about big money political ad buys, an ad with a 2.9 point relevance score, you know, in this particular test that they did, resulted in an average cost per click of 0.142, whereas the ad with an eight point score had a cost per click of 0.03. The Facebook ad variation with the higher relevance score resulted in 400% better ROI. You get more bang for your buck if you've got more relevant content, uh, and therefore you're reaching more people and you're engaging more people with your content. So, you know, what, what are some other solutions here? Create lots of positive contrast and negative images. Advertise them to the target audience. Monitor your reach, frequency, and engagement. So we're always looking at, you know, what's our target? How many people are in that universe of voters that we're, we're looking for? Then how do I get that reach up in the 80s or, you know, if I can get close to 90, great. And then I also want to make sure that that creative is seen multiple times by somebody so we actually know that it sticks. So those are the three key statistics that we look at. We also look at relevance score as well so that we're making sure that we're getting the most bang for our buck. Um, you know, and so we're looking at for relevance score and that relevance score out that we did, 10 out of 10, which means that we're getting more positive feedback and it's costing us less to deliver than most Facebook ads. Um, don't let the perfect be the enemy of your good. A lot of times, you know, the old way of political consulting, and I remember when I got started in the industry, is that we'd sit there on a piece of literature or a newspaper ad for a week at a time and like mull over like, you know, what color variation we're gonna use at uh, like, you know, this particular font or whatever. You know, don't let that perfect be the enemy of the good. In these, in today's media environment, you wanna be producing a lot of content so you can make sure that it cuts through that clutter and, you know, hits your targeted audiences. Um, so create lots of video, prioritize quantity and on-message creatives. I'm not saying produce crappy ads, but I am saying that you, can, you don't need to necessarily be spending as much money as we do in the status quo. Also, some ads can actually, that are lower ad quality, have lower production quality, actually have more engagement statistics than ads with higher production quality. So you need to have like a, a, a mix of both. So expensive production isn't always the most effective, and you also want to have relevant and fresh content reigning supreme because of the staleness of ads over time, or the staleness of your creative over time, and people moving on to new creative. The other advantage to producing a lot of creative is that if you do have that targeted audience, the odds that you know you're going to reach that audience with any one particular creative and they're going to remember it is low. But if you bombard that audience with a lot of creative, the more likelihood they are going to be to see one of your messages and therefore get your message. So I'm gonna show you an example from a campaign that Rick and I worked on in uh, Bermuda that was a really low quality, a low uh, production cost ad, but was on message and creative and worked. So I don't know how to turn on the video. Sure. Just 
Just to show you can do cool design bad. Simon from Electric Technology. Um, we're a uh, tech company, we're a platform company really. We uh, provide solutions here in the UK to electric representatives. About 50% of all competitions in Westminster use our software solutions to help them tackle their engagements with cross companies. And today I'm going to talk about some, some work that we did in Australia. Um, so we've only been working in Australia for about nine months, and I didn't really expect anybody who probably had that much knowledge of Australia to be here. So somebody who's lived there for 10 years is probably going to tell me that everything I think about Australia is entirely wrong. <laughs> so uh, I apologize for that. So we're going to talk about the campaign uh, that we worked on. Um, and so the client, uh, the client was a politician called uh, Barnaby Joyce, who, if you have, uh, don't follow Australian politics, it's pretty unlikely that you do. It's very difficult to follow from anywhere but outside Australia. But uh, things that you might need to know about him are, firstly, He's a man that likes to wear a hat. Uh, a lot, a hat a lot. Indoors, outdoors, everything. So Barnaby is uh, basically the Australians of Australia. He is an incredibly Australian uh, man, and he represents a very rural seat. Uh, he's the leader of the National Party over there. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Now, the only other reason you might have heard of Barnaby Joyce is if you uh, are a fan of Johnny Depp, in which case you may have seen this. One years old, um, otherwise AKA Jack Sparrow, and he has decided to bring to our nation two dogs without actually getting the proper certification and the, the proper permit required. Now, Mr. Depp has to either take his dog back to California or we're going to have to euthanize him. But if you can start letting movie stars, even though they've been the sexiest man alive twice, to come into our nation, then why don't we just break the laws for everybody? So uh, it's time that pistol and booze started off back to the United States. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's Barnaby. He was very, in, outside Australia, everybody laughed at that. But I think inside Australia, they, they take their, their biosecurity laws really seriously. Um, yeah. So amongst a certain audience, it was quite important. So uh, Barnaby is, uh, or was, and I'll explain a little bit more about that, the Deputy Prime Minister. So, uh, and leader of the National Party. So at this point, it's probably useful to explain a little bit about Australian politics. So they have a uh, federal and state level parliaments, and in the federal level, they've got a bicameral parliament with 150 odd <coughs> members. 
Um, now, the interesting thing about Australia is they've got one of the longest lasting coalitions in electoral history anywhere in the world between the Liberal Party and the National Party. It's a little bit like if here in the UK we had Shire Tories uh, in the countryside and Tories that were uh, in the more urban areas. So, and it's an interesting thing when you in this comments about polarization as well. Uh, I'm thinking about what the yesterday about Catalan, uh, where the nationals hold quite a lot of power within the, the coalition. They represent the 25% of people basically that don't live in uh, urban areas in Australia. They are the rural things. They hold a lot of power. You know, they have. I think it's. Uh, I think they've got. 10 MPs out of 76 MPs that make up the government benches, um, but they hold the deputy prime minister position and they hold some other positions as well. Uh, opposition is the Labour Party at the moment. Um, and in the House of Reps, there's also five crossbenchers. Australia's quite interesting in that it's had, uh, in the last uh, election cycles, some more independent candidates and smaller parties come through as well. Um, interesting, over in Australia, we work with some of the independents as, uh, as well, the smaller parties too. Um, and at the moment, or at the time of the by-election, the government had a majority of just two, which is pretty small. So uh, ultimately, so why did this by-election happen? It is a bizarrely, uniquely Australian scandal that led to it. And it's all involved something called Section 44 of the Constitution, which slightly strangely for a country which is pretty much made up of immigrants, says that if you are a dual citizen, you cannot be a federal politician. Um, and it turned out, uh, that if you are, before being nominated as a candidate, you've got to renounce any citizenship. And in August and September last year, it turned out that there were seven MPs and senators that were not as Australian as they seemed. And they were referred to the High Court to decide on whether they really should have been elected. One of those, Mr. The Man Who Is like Australia Personified Within Politics, uh, was one of them. Uh, it turned out that his dad uh, had a New Zealand citizenship, and as a result, he was actually a Kiwi by uh, descent as well, which was quite upsetting to him, I think, and quite confusing. <laughs> so, on the 27th of October, the High Court ruled on all the cases. Five people were ruled ineligible. One of them was Barnaby Joyce. And uh, on the same day, a writ was issued for the by-election in his constituency of New England to take place on the 2nd of December. So, it was a very short campaign period. It was just 36 days of polling. There were some reasons around why it had to be so quick, because basically the government needed its majority in the House. And if he wasn't sitting there, then it put various bits of legislation at risk. Now, in the national picture, on the 30th of October, there was a news poll that put Labour at 54% and the coalition at 46%. Um, and then by the 13th of November, through the campaign, uh, campaign it had actually got slightly worse. Labour were at 55 and the coalition were at 45 so that was the national polling picture that the by-election was sort of fought against. So we've been working with the New South Wales Nationals, which is the, the uh, state level of the uh, national party there, to pilot some of our voter ID technology uh, in, uh, in their seats. And so basically we used to uh, roll out our system there for them called Voter ID. It's an integrated data platform, combines voting intention, case working correspondence management, segmentation, bold mailouts, SMS, and tele telephony and IVR as well. And they were, before we moved over, we were using a legacy platform that was run by their coalition partners. It was a desktop application that had been sort of dragged into the modern world. It had a new web interface, but it couldn't do day-to-day -day tasks using that. It was really slow. It could take minutes or even hours just to count the number of voters in a segment. So previously, they had real trouble with building, with looking to analyze their data and just get an idea of you know, how many people, even like how many bits of literature do we need to print out? Just to run a report to say, okay, how many people live in this area could take 15 minutes. So the interesting thing about data protection, I'm not sure if James is still in the room, uh, for Australia is that um, Australian politicians and political parties wrote themselves out their data protection laws a little while ago. Um, so they don't have to really worry about them. Coming from a British point of view, I found that quite horrifying. Um, but one of the things that that means is that they rely quite heavily, uh, some of the parties, on their elected representatives collecting data for the political parties, which something isn't allowed here in the UK. <coughs> so with 34 days to polling, 
the we itself a new installation for them for New England. We transferred all the data out of their legacy system, uh, and they also rolled out. So two days later, they also trialed their uh, campaign uh, office in a box concept, which was some laptop computers, some voice over IP phones, and a 4G router. So rather than having to wait for telephone lines to be installed to get broadband, which in Australia can take quite a long time, they rocked up, found an office that they could rent on the high street, and two days later they had a staff campaign office, they had a data system, and they were ready to go. And it's something that we're expanding with them as we go. So in terms of some of the things that, that we help them do, so we help them do just normal day-to-day -day voter engagement. So when people emailed, helping them to reply, helping them to record people's details, and these are all real basic things, but things that they really struggled with, with their old system. And the other thing that we helped them do was do segmenting and modeling voters. So the Australian electoral rolls is very similar to, to the UK electoral rolls, but they're much richer. They've got loads of information on about people's occupations, about they've got their telephone numbers, uh, they've got their data birth, they've got their nationality, all kinds of information that's really useful for modeling and for segmenting. And it was something that we could do really easily for them as well. So if I throw a, and I'm gonna try and make a web browser appear, or not. There we go, right. So uh, this is our voter ID system, just to give you an idea of the kind of things that they were able to do. So they could, they could look at somebody's file, record, record their voting details, etc., really easily. Um, things like replying to emails through the system. So it's one of the things that they really liked that they could do for the first time is emails drop into the system, we match them automatically to their electoral roll, ask them if they wanted to store their email address. And one of the things that we found that by just making people better at dealing with correspondence, correspondence, recording more details, they've increased the size of their mailing list in six months in some of our trial sites by upwards of 20%. And that's without doing any microsites, petitions, or anything like that. It's just about recording the details of people that are engaging with them much better. Uh, and then the other thing they were able to do was just segment people and actually then engage with them. So they could do things like, say, I want to find all the voters in a particular town. So say, so this is a demo installation with some made up data in. I want to find anybody that lives in Lansdowne that is between the age of, so this is running a little bit slower than it normally would because it's running on our Sydney servers. So we can find everybody in a particular area, look at where they live on a map, etc. And this was something that was transformational for them. They'd never been able to look at data like this before because before they were just running reports, getting Excel spreadsheets, etc. And then from that, we let them do things like, so they could write their campaign letters straight inside the applications, oh, in the other name, uh, and roll things out. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I've only got a limited time, so I'm not gonna, because we're actually gonna kind of bore you with it. Um, so segmenting and modeling voters, something else we do. We did targeted their, they did their targeted poll mailouts, um, and then free polling was an interesting thing, and it's something that is, was different to our experience of working in the UK. So in Australia, you get polls open early in certain locations, unlike here in the UK, where you do, where our free polling is postal votes, where people register and you return them by post. Over in Australia, people with uh, can only get postal votes under certain circumstances if you're not mobile and can't get to the polling station. But parties still want to lock their voters in early, so they try and encourage them to do pre polling. One of the things that we did with that was use SMS to get in touch with people, tell them that their pre -poll, where their pre-polling was, tell them that it was open, and what they, used, what they actually did was then get the returns back from the, uh, from the uh, pre-polling, see how many people were voting, and see if it increased turnout in particular areas, and did some A-B testing or messaging for them. And they found that actually engaging with people via SMS, telling them where their pre-polls were, increased their turnout quite significantly uh, over the over where it was. Um, and then one of the other things that we did, did for them, which was also something that they hadn't been able to do before at an affordable price point, was IVR surveys. So this was telephoning, telephoning people automatically. Um, it culminated in us, we called 25,000 people on their behalf in two hours with an automated message. Uh, it, the scripts were tested in the run up to it. Uh, all of the data that they collected went back into their, their database so that they could then follow it up. 
Um, and one of the interesting things with, about this was that actually mo quite a lot of those calls went to a voicemail. The, the, again, this was something they hadn't been able to do before, and for some people who are from America, this is really easy stuff that a lot of you do. Um, but uh, Barnaby Joyce had a recorded message on people's answer phones. The next day, they got nearly a thousand phone calls into the office asking to speak to Barnaby, saying that they were really glad that he called and uh, could they let him know what was going on. It was really, it really surprised everybody. And I think that sometimes when you work in politics and you get a bit cynical, you forget how much people out there don't know how everything works. So on polling day, interesting thing about Australia, as uh, was mentioned before, uh, they've got compulsory voting, um, which again, coming from the UK system, where we're all about get out the vote, differential turnout, etc. Everyone has to vote, so you don't win an election on differential <coughs> turnout. Um, but instead, because they've got preferential voting, it means that it's all about preferences and making sure that your volunteers are there to give people their complicated cards that explain how you should vote uh, in order that your candidate will win. So they used to, a lot of our systems to coordinate their activists uh, and make sure that people were at the polling stations and to keep them up to date with things as well. So the result, where did it end up? So, on polling day, 64.9% uh, of the vote went to the nationals. Uh, Labour got 11.12 and the independents 6.79. So it was a swing of 12.63% to the nationals, which was the uh, largest swing to a government candidate in Australian by-election history which I'm not going to pretend we had all that much to do with it, but when you get a win, we like to say that now. <laughs> but, of course, three months is a long time in politics, and uh, Barnaby uh, Joyce, unfortunately, is no longer Deputy Prime Minister <laughs> after a scandal involving his uh, media <laughs> assistant, uh, having a baby, uh, he was forced to stand down uh, reasonably recently. But we still get to say that we work for the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. And that's my very rapid presentation. Thank you. Uh, we didn't have time to look at the media system, so it was quick. Uh, no, just a, just a question. So he had he had to give up uh, Kiwis and New Zealand uh, yeah, citizenship, so and that's that was able to rerun. That was able to rerun. Yeah. So by the time, so effectively, to the point at which you are um, uh, nominated, you aren't allowed to be a dual citizen. So as soon as he found out, he renounced his citizenship, which meant that by the time the by-election actually, by the time the Brits moved for the by-election and he was nominated as the candidate, he could stand again. Like I said, it's a really strange little quirk of Australia's system. Um, which is left over from like com from when they federated and the gold rush and making sure that Chinese people couldn't do things. Anything else?